On the profile interview segment this week, I'll be speaking with the president of NLC, Comrade Joe Ajero. It brings us up to speed on how workers fared in the last one year, while also emphasizing on the need for the federal government to ensure that the minimum wage negotiation is concluded in good time. It's good to have you on the program. Congratulations on a successful outing. Can you bring us up to speed on how workers have been faring in the last one year between May 2023 and May 2024? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it has not been bed of roses. The challenge has been enormous. Uh, last May Day was a normal May Day. Just like a few May Days before it. But Immediately after that May Day, just close to the end of May, May 29th, the narrative changed by a mere pronouncement on the uh, removal of subsidy. Everybody started running helter skelter. Nigerian workers, Nigerian people, you know, started lamenting. And it was real. You know, the level of uh, change and adjustment that from 185, 195 to about 500 and something in the first instance, and probably around six or 700, you know, was such a, a dramatic shift that it impacted on real wages. Mm -hmm. And between that and how we responded to it and how the Nigerian state, you know, responded to our reaction, was a very big, you know, a determinant on what was happening in the industrial relations space. So, and that was what happened. Now, all other byproducts, you know, like a uh, wage award, like trying Palliative. to palliatives, all those issues were drawn. And even the reaction and insistence that the refineries must work were all direct responses, you know, from the increase, you know, uh, in home prices of PMS. Ordinarily, I will tell you that the issue of deregulation or deregulation could be an economic ideology, but it translated to, to increase in home prices, which we had to confront with on a daily basis. So we only came up with some other options like uh, the issue of CNG as a viable alternative. And at that point, those in charge, you know, some of the functionaries of government were asking us what is the meaning of CNG. And we explained to them, and they saw it as a likely option. And we argued that if we, have dis if we had discussed these options before removal of subsidy, probably the CNG could have taken effect. And if it takes effect, even when you remove subsidy, nobody will witness it. But we had thought, you know, that they could have given it adequate attention. And that within three months or four months, we could have gone far on the issue of CNG. We could have equally drastically mitigated the effect of the increase in pump prices of payments. So that has been the issue. And then within this one year, we are calculating the old minimum wage expired. Uh, it expired on the 18th of April. Ordinarily, yes, uh, a, a, a law that has a lifespan, before the expiration of that law, you had about four years or five years to have, you know, done the amendment, change the new minimum wage. Uh, we won't say it was, it came out to us by surprise, if after five years, and the new minimum wage was to take effect from 18th of uh, April, and up to now, we have not concluded that matter. So you can see that these are some of the uh, developments that have, we have witnessed. And within that time, the Naira started falling, crashing down. Inflation went to, you know, a double digit, and on and on and on. You know, almost cost of living became another thing, and the worker happened to be at the receiving end. Mm -hmm. So that is what has transpired you know, as far as industrial relations practice 
what actually took place in the economy and the policy direction of the state is indirectly impacting on the worker. There's no permanent solution. Even if you had paid people palliative, it is not a permanent solution. It's mere tokenism. It's to the effect. Yes, the cushion effect. But to what extent is the effect being cushioned? That's, I think that's the where we are now. So what's been the relationship with government <coughs> in terms of um, getting them to do things, in terms of um, collective bargaining agreement? Well, a government will be government. You know, the way it is, you know, every government in power have their own approach. But I would have preferred an approach of, you know, yeah, this is the problem. How do we solve it? The solution could come from the unions. You know, the solution could come from government. Or this is the way we want to do it. You know, what do you think? You know, if you do it that way, it will affect us to this extent. You know, since we are the people that will suffer it or the people that will implement the policy, we suggest you do it this. And if you have such interaction, uh, there won't be a problem. But when you have a uh, fifth columnist, there are people that will just write banner headlines. They, will, they may write label insults, Minister A or B. They will give interpretation, label uncompromising, and all that. Then it is a problem. You know, it's a problem to understand that uh, instead of you people engaging, uh, there is a top force. For instance, this electricity tariff, the next one we can reverse it, follow the law, follow the rules. You know, the administrative rules set up for the, you know, for you to have tariff increase, follow it, consult. That one well. Now, the other one, minimum wage has expired. As of today, we don't have any minimum wage. Hmm. But the labor movement will still endure to the end of May. And it's enough time to conclude this matter. Now, but you see a lot of interpretations. They are uncompromising, whatever. So, but if they engage level, oh, this one you said within whatever, uh, one month. Meanwhile, the president in his speech, presented by uh, either the minister of level or VP, now said it will take effect from this month. But we can harmonize it because it will not take effect from this month. It will take effect from the 18th. And we harmonize it and move ahead. It then means it's equally conscious that the old one has expired. So we'll come up with something that is mutually, you know, acceptable to the parties and that is doable and move on. So we are open. Can you tell me what would happen if the necessary stakeholders, after the expiration of the ultimatum, what should we be expecting from labor? Apart from the unilateral nature of the action of NEC, of not consulting extensively with the relevant stakeholders. There are some other areas that are faulty. The act is clear. They have to, you know, do public hearing with the relevant labor and other stakeholders. Labor as in the NLC general other workers and the workers in the sector <clears throat> that's the immediate stakeholders in the power sector I'm not sure that actually took place that is one two having a discriminatory supply system makes it suspect these people are on band A will give you 20 hours these people are on band C, maybe will give you six hours. Why? Electricity is not stranded anywhere. If you can give somebody in Baesa 20 hours, you can give somebody in Lagos 20 hours, you can give somebody in, Leg in Sokoto 20 hours. If probably the conveying machinery, maybe the transmission line or the reception network, is in order. Now, if it is not in order, it is your duty, assuming the transformer is bad, to produce a relief transformer or to do line tracing, you know, to correct it for the people. To, but for you to deliberately now give certain number of people 
20 hours and increase the money. You are going to charge them for 20 hours. And give the other people 6 hours and probably charge them less according to what you are saying. What informs it? You know, apart from the electricity bill for economic purposes, it is for social services. And uh, we felt that in Nigeria of today, we can't have apartheid. We can't have discriminatory electricity supply. It's just like saying that you are going to s give people in uh, one state, let's say Lagos, you know, enough fuel. And that the people in Abuja, you give them fuel two times a day because you banded it. Maybe the ones in Lagos, you give them bound A, this one. Just like any other product, including kerosene, including uh, gari. Oh, I'm going to send only one bag of gari to Abuja. But I will send 20 bags to Kaduna. Now, how do you come to such economic policy or, or calculation, which is what they have done in terms of uh, uh, what is happening in electricity? And the involvement of the uh, Minister of Power is suspect. You know, for you to go into price fixing in a deregulated economy or deregulated sector, we were made to understand that such sectors are, you know, driven by market forces. And then for you now to say, we're going to charge you this, it's going to be this amount, then there's a problem in it. Because after privatization, the state we are supposed to hands off, despite the fact that the Nigerian state still controls 40% in some of the you know, uh, sectors, especially in the discourse. Now, why will even a minister be talking of that if this tariff is not paid, Nigerians will be without electricity? That's a threat. It doesn't have any role. Electricity Regulatory Commission has a critical role. But even in the act, there was a provision for consumer assistance fund where it was provided that those Ni Nigerians who cannot provide or who don't have money to this, that the cons consumer assistance fund will release this amount for them to have supply. As we talk today, there is even no a parameter to determine those Nigerians that cannot afford electricity. What will be your reaction to the incessant uh, fuel scarcity that uh, Nigerians are battling with? Let me say this, and that's uh, whether electricity, whether uh, PMS or diesel, countries of this world, especially Europe, are going to uh, renewed energy. They are, they, are, they are paying more attention to what we call green energy, solar, wind, hydro. Studies have proved that it is cheaper to go to it through renewable energy than using the fossil fuel, which is what we are using today. If you continue to use fossil fuel, use uh, gas, use uh, uh, fuel, use all these ones, the prices will continue to go high. And there will be much pressure on this same PMS because you will use it to generate electricity. If you no countries where you have CNG and even electric, electric motors, you discover that you reduce that you know, number of liters that is being consumed through vehicles. And the pollution that goes with it, Nigeria government promised the whole world in the climate change uh, a conference that they will ensure a zero, zero emission policy by 2060. And there is no effort being made today. So if we are generating electricity through hydro water and it's a renewable energy, if we are generating through solar or even uh, wind turbines, you will discover that there will be less pressure on a PMS. Thank you very much for your time. Yes. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember that labor creates wealth.